I may say something, a man might say the exact same verbatim sentence. Oh, chestnut. <laughs> and it just received so drastically differently. The most obvious thing, but apparently difficult thing for many leaders is to choose abundance rather than fear. People think that this is something fluffy and soft and emotional. My leadership style is transparent and inclusive. If you adopt a fear and command and control based environment, you as a leader become the single point of failure. What three tips would you give women who are very passionate about their careers, they want to get ahead, they want to get promoted, they want to get to the top? What three tips would you give them? The first tip would be Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader? That your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Silvana, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. So good to have you on the show. Hi, thank you. It's really lovely to be here. Yes, I've been really looking forward to talking with you and really getting to know your journey and getting some leadership lessons, especially the fact that, you know, you've risen through the ranks to, you know, mm. probably senior position that you can within a fashion business. So, you know, getting to be a COO for a founder of, you know, large fashion brand, Superdry. Mm. So my first question is, what does leadership mean to you? It's a really good question. Um, leadership to me really means creating an environment so that the team or the organization, depending on the, the size of, of the remit, is enabled to do the best possible job that they can. And I also think that in recent years, leadership also includes really looking at the person as a whole as well. And, um, you know, with the blurring of the work and the life, in particular since the pandemic, I've noticed a big increase of resetting of the rules between managers and employees with regards to what employees expect. Um, and rightfully so, actually. So to me, leadership really is knowing the whole person um, and creating the environment for the team to work in the best possible way together and deliver the results. Mm. It's so true that you're talking about, especially during COVID time, like there's this, this big shift of employees having or demanding more power and more control. And mm. so that relationship, that dynamic is, is really being impacted. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is. And, you know, I think it is also, um, a transition that managers are going through because you're not going to be at the end of the day, it is still a, uh, it is still a professional relationship, right? So you're not going to be somebody's priest or therapist or parent, right? To, to deal with their lives. Um, but knowing largely and roughly what is going on in people's lives if they choose to share that with you, which they have been doing a lot more in recent years, can really help to create a safe environment at work for people mm -hmm. as well. But the, the, I think what managers and leaders are trying to, to develop and to learn is where's that boundary still? Because at the end of the day, we're still a business. We need to deliver results. Um, and how do you not go too far either direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm 
a person. I love these kinds of transitions and intersections. So to me, um, putting the person um, and the personal aspect into the, the work relationship is something that I, I embrace and I enjoy. Mm. So how would you describe your leadership style and how is it different to your male counterparts? Yeah, I think my leadership style is transparent and inclusive. And, um, and that is actually not necessarily a difference between a male or a female counterpart. But what I do believe is that um, there is a difference with regards to, um, again, generalizing, but feminine energy and masculine energy in business, which um, is genderless even though the word wouldn't, wouldn't say that. And I think the big difference is we all as leaders need to achieve business results with our teams and organizations, right? So that applies to every leader. That's a, a key goal, right? Whatever those business results are. But having really an awareness and an appreciation and seeing the value of creating team success as well um, that is something where I do notice a difference, um, again, generalizing and generally speaking. And I think it might be because um, being a woman, I have experienced growing up the ranks how difficult it is if a manager doesn't consider creating team success an important point as well. Because big parts of that are giving your team the tools to further develop, for example, right? Giving your team the tools to um, communicate effectively. Um, so to me, that aspect, creating team success is a big differentiator. Mm. You mentioned that you have worked in situations where, you know, the, the goal of your boss effectively wasn't to create sort of that team dynamic. Yeah. How did you feel working in that way and what did you do about it yeah so in my experience if it doesn't happen usually it is in an environment where it's more of a command and control environment and maybe micromanaging as well and um usually it is a case of uh the leader or the manager that i would would have had being driven by a fear really and um, what I've seen it do to a team and to me as an individual in the past is you, you basically you create loss of human creativity in the team and in the organization if you, if you manage that way. And the most obvious thing, but apparently difficult thing for many leaders is to choose abundance rather than fear mm -hmm. when they lead and create a culture of empowerment. And, um, and what I've noticed is that when I have these conversations with peers or had them over the years with peers is that, or even mid managers of mine, right? Is that sometimes people think that this is, uh, something fluffy and soft and emotional, um, but my point is, is that actually going back to what we were saying earlier, if the first purpose of a business is to deliver results, right, and achieve business results, you cannot get there if you don't have a high performing team. And um, in order to have a high performing team for longevity, you need to give them the framework and the tools that allow them to go there. Because if you don't do that, if you adopt a fear and command and control based environment, you as a leader become the single point of failure. And then all of a sudden it's not so fluffy and soft anymore, but it's actually pretty hardcore. Yeah. Like you actually become the issue as a leader. So how did you realize this? I mean, or how did you overcome operating yeah. from a place of fear versus operating yeah. from a place of abundance? Yeah, I actually used to, uh, the first seven years of my career, roughly, 
Um, I used to progress pretty steadily at the time. In, and where was this? Where? This was at Nike. Yeah. And um, yeah, I came in at, you know, a trend, like doing a job at a transactional level in customer service. And um, I progressed over those seven years. And um, what Nike did at the time, it was almost looking back now, I felt like it, I was in a video game. Mm -hmm. Like you could do challenges and you would go a level up and you would do and it was challenging and exciting and fun for me. And so it happened quite easily. But also in those seven years, I was really focused on delivering results. And it was also encouraged, right? Get there no matter how, right? Deliver that. And um, I was like one of those little, you know, those little wind up toys that kids have that like jump around. And I was just like going. I was like one of those bunnies. I was like, like focused and going towards it. I loved it. I was super young. And I then had the opportunity to join a one year uh, leadership development program. And I was exposed to a mentor, the teacher of that program, who had been with Nike 35 for some years already. He actually had retired already at the time and came back to do this program. And he was the one who really prompted me and mentored me and the other people in that program to reflect back and to learn new principles of looking at how do you want to show up as a leader? And he really helped me to find my leadership voice in that process. And there was a moment I woke up in the middle of the night. We were in um, Vietnam at the time with the program. And I woke up at like 3 a.m. or something. It was a really intense week, that trip. And I just, it just clicked how, how I was behaving before. And I was so embarrassed and I was just going through each situation where I only had been focusing on achieving business results. And I completely was oblivious. It wasn't that I ignored it, but I was completely oblivious of uh, creating team success in the process. And that's when it clicked for me and I realized that, okay, you can be a subject matter expert and you can be the best. You can be a fantastic high performer and you can actually get really far. A lot of senior leaders are that still to this day, right? But does it really fulfill you in the long term? And you can actually be so much more if you change that mindset and you really unlock an organization. And recently, actually just yesterday, I received one of the best compliments that I feel I can get as a professional, as a leader, which was somebody telling me that in the last year and a half that he reported to me, I unlocked so many doors in him. And it was brilliant to hear that because I could see it. I could see him grow and develop as a leader himself. Um, but I had never associated it back to me and my leadership style. But then when he said it yesterday, it was just, it was just really a nice moment, the biggest compliment for mm. me. It's nice to be recognized for something that you are working on proactively. Yeah. But going back, you've mentioned that it was somebody who you were reporting to that drew attention to this. Am I correct? In it, was that? A it was a teacher of this program that right. I was in. Yeah. And was the feedback directed to you or is it something that was part of the course? It was part of the course. Mm -hmm. It was really about uh, one of the big pillars of that was how do you create a culture of empowerment? And of course, you need to then understand why do you need to have a culture of empowerment? But then he also, he, well, he spent a lot of time with each student, but I felt that he really spoke to me and he gave me some really good feedback and asked me predominantly the right questions to reflect. So he didn't really per se tell me like, this is what you've done wrong in the past. Actually, he never said that, but he really asked me the right questions. And um, and he also really helped me recognize what kind of leader am I? So he used the difference or he differentiated it in you have, um, because after I did that, I went back to him when I realized how my behavior had been before. And I had been rated highly successful or exceptional from a performance review up until that point. So it's not, you know, it's not like I was, I had heard any other feedback up until that point. 
But when I went back to him and I said, oh, I've had this realization and I feel horrible about what happened. And it really did something with my confidence at the time as well. Um, and he then told me, he said, well, after a couple of weeks, he said, Silvana, I see you're really struggling with this. Don't devalue who you are. Don't lose who you are. I mean, you've been successful. That's why you're here, right? But use this as an opportunity for you to, to identify what kind of leader you are. And in his experience, he said, you can be a farmer who cultivates, or you can be a warrior who sometimes throws a stick of dynamite and creates constructive dissatisfaction. He called it constructive dissatisfaction with the status quo. And he said, you're, you're the warrior, right? But even if you're a warrior, like tap into the farmer part, because I can see now, now you know, you know, that, that it will give you a lot if you do that. And so I went into that and, and really honed in on cultivating organizations and teams. And then a couple of years later, I had a mentor who actually gave me another really important piece of feedback because he said he did not know all this history. Um, and he told me, um, it's okay. He was like, you're a phenomenal coach now. You're fantastic. Uh, really great at coaching people. But sometimes you need to manage people as well. And you just really need to hold them accountable. So don't, his feedback was don't cultivate it too much. Also, not every, a culture of empowerment doesn't mean everything goes. And that was, I think, another step change for me in my confidence level and going like, okay, you can actually do the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's not one or the other. You can do both things. And I really needed to go through that journey. So it took me about, you know, a good, like probably 10 years to get really balanced out and honed into my leadership voice, basically. Mm. I love this story <laughs> because it's like you were doing great Mm. things were you know you were delivering on your yeah. results yeah but taking feedback that you can just basically just ignore yeah but really you know being empathetic to understand that actually you can be improving in all of those areas and then applying it and seeing huge benefits that it reaps yeah it's um yeah, yeah it's, it was it's a, a phenomenal gift. skill to be able to <laughs> kind of take the feedback on board and not let it consume you yeah but actually you know draw up the best parts of you yeah yeah and I mean it really was just I really viewed it as such phenomenal gifts and they have been truly uh game-changing for me in my professional life one of the questions I have which is going back to kind of male and yeah. female leadership have you experienced resistance from leading men? Yeah. And what did that look like? <laughs> um, funnily enough, not from leading men, but I have experienced resistance from peers, male peers, or male managers as well. Um, and I don't know why that actually that's a really, I don't know why there is a differentiating, but from leading men, not so much. Um, the resistance that I've usually heard or, or experienced is that I may say something and a man might say the exact same verbatim sentence. Oh, chestnut. <laughs> and, and it just received so drastically differently that sometimes you feel like, am I speaking a different, like, am I literally not speaking in English? Am I using a different language here? And um, that is glaring, but also so hidden to um, men sometimes in a team that that happens, right? Um, I think that is the most, the most glaring one that I have experienced where you kind of like just look around the room. And what did you do? <laughs> um, Sometimes, sometimes I'll call it out and I'll say like, I think that's exactly what I just said. Um, and when you do that though, it does make the others on the team feel very uncomfortable as well. And sometimes I think that that's okay. Um, 
I think what's more important is that when you are in a situation like that, what you really need is somebody else to be your ally and somebody else to really uh, speak up. And so I try to always play that role if I see it happening. So I, what I always try to do is amplify a lot of what somebody said. Also by saying, well, as Maria just said, <laughs> I think that's a really great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is pretty typical, though, what happens is that if there isn't somebody around who does that, it kind of just fizzles out. And it's a shame that, you know, we're in 2023 and it still, it still happens. And we're still talking about We're that. still talking about yeah. this. It gets kind of old and boring, doesn't yeah. it? Well, yeah. it, it, it's not old and boring. I think it's just you wish for it to be different and yeah. it just isn't. It's still there. Yeah. Who has been that person who has done that for you? It has. I, so we were just talking about the first 10 years of my mm -hmm. development and career. So the second 10 years of my development and career um, has really been amplified through women, which I think is really fascinating. And um, I have had in the last, well, now it's 13, like in the last 13 years, I have had so many women that were either my peers or more senior that have really taken that role on and amplified it and paid it forward. And um, seeing them do that uh, mimicked it, like allowed me to adopt that and go like, wow, that is amazing. That's like the biggest help. So I'm going to do that as well and pay it forward. What advice would you give women who are navigating these sort of power structures? Yeah. I would say, and this is really challenging, right? Is my advice would be stay true to yourself and stay close to yourself, but that's also really hard. Mm -hmm. But I think that I have seen women also try to be one of the boys and that is just never really very pretty either, right? So my advice would be stay true to yourself, but also stand your ground. And then there's, of course, that paradox with women where um, there is the unconscious bias where you can either be very capable or very likable. And we still have to balance those two things often, right? It's not always this, this way, but often that is a thing that women are dealing with in, in the professional life. And to me, at the end of the day, the answer always is stay true to yourself. Don't try to be something other than what you are, but also find your tribe. And um, to me, being in touch with a network of other women who have similarities to what my life is like, and my life is I have a career, I work full time. That's a choice that I make. And I have also a family and children, and I love to have interactions with other women that are in the same um, type of life because it gives me so much to learn from their experiences. And I would say now, these last couple of years, um, I have shifted away from just being a sponge, mm -hmm. right, and have moved more into also being able to share with other women that are a couple of years behind me in their career or in the, you know, children that they have, the age of their children. Um, but the best practical advice that I've been given has come from women in these last couple of and years. What has this practical advice look like? So yeah. I'm going to ask you, like, it's, it's this <laughs> ultimate question that men never get asked. Like, how yeah. do you balance, you know, your work, your family, yeah. your passions, your hobbies, your, yeah. you know, kids, you know, everything yeah. that you have to do. Yeah. 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 The best advice that I've gotten was to prioritize myself. And that was 10, eight, eight, 10 years ago. So hard for me. Um, I had my children, they are 15 months apart. And so one yeah, after mine. the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so yeah. it's intense. Mm -hmm. And I was a director at Nike in the US at the time and uh, working full time. And then in the US, you work pretty much until 
you pop mm -hmm. basically and then weeks after that you're mm -hmm. back again mm -hmm. and um wow did i underestimate what pregnancy does and what having children does to you as a person i completely had no clue um i really thought like oh i'm just gonna do this mm -hmm. right it's gonna be fine and um it took me until my daughter was one and a half she's the second born so it took me like three years to realize something isn't working <laughs> like yeah. This is really hard. It was kind of like this realization that I had. Something is just not working for me right now. And I couldn't articulate what it was. And I told my husband that I needed time off, basically. And um, because I had heard these other women say, you need to prioritize yourself. And I didn't even know how to start because... What that means. It was so easy before there were kids. And I just didn't realize that I actually had a lot of downtime <laughs> before, mm -hmm. right? That, that just had evaporated. And um, and at that point, I did not realize that either. And so I took a week off and, um, and I did nothing <laughs> basically that whole week. And, but even to take the week off, I felt so guilty taking the week off and not doing something with my family or, and, but I forced myself to just take that one week off and I did not know what the outcome was going to be of it. And I just stewed basically at definitely for three, four days. I was just like stewing is the best word. And I wasn't socializing. I wasn't doing anything. And then I was getting actually also, and I was just in my feelings and it went from not being completely oblivious to then freaking out, to then thinking, am I burning out? Is this what is happening? Like, what is going on here? And at the end of the week, I just realized I need to change something. I cannot do this all. Um, and then I kind of confronted the fear that was completely self-imposed like of going to my husband and talking about what was important for me. <laughs> So you were afraid to speak to him about that? I was. And I mean, wow. my husband is the most accommodating, sweet mm -hmm. person. <laughs> really, that's that's why I married him. And um, it just really made me realize. But one thing that was on, one thing that was a finding of that week, what I told him is I gave him feedback because despite him being really accommodating and sweet, what he never did was be proactive in the relationship and so even though he was helping out a ton and we were definitely splitting the housework and the care and everything, I really cannot say that we didn't do that, but it was all triggered by me. So it was all the mind space. And this is a very common thing that happens that women are the brain of like the family, basically. And it's an Italian saying, right? Where um, they say the man, is the, the man is the head of the family, mm -hmm. but the woman is the neck. Yeah. So without a neck, nothing yeah. like... And obviously the man is not the head of the family. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I just had come to this realization that, wow, all the thinking, like a lot of capacity goes into like thinking about, like strategizing what we need to do as a family, but then also tactically and practically. I can delegate and he was a good recipient of it, but I didn't want to delegate. <laughs> like I did not want to lose that mind space and capacity. And so we had a conversation and it was as afraid as I was about that. It was actually a really good conversation. And he was, it was like a light bulb went off for him and, and he was really unaware. And, um, and he was really clear on that. Hey, this is, I'm, it's breaking me as a person, like something needs to change and he cares about me. He loves me. And so, it was a real quick and easy change for him. And we just created some super practical things. Like we have a shared calendar now in our iPhone, for example. And he puts just as many appointments in there as I do when it's about, you know, the kids going to the dentist or whatever, um, as a stupid example. So that was a big unlock. Me, articul me knowing what I needed and then me articulating it to him, how he could help me in that. And then him being willing to do that and recognizing it. 
And then the other thing was also me being really, really black and white. If something is not on my list of priorities, I don't care about it. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> exactly. And so one of those things is, we were talking about it earlier, one of those things is what our house looks like. Yes, <laughs> I can live. I can live in a, I mean, yes. Oh my gosh, I would love to have like, you know, a uh, architect digest looking house. Of course. That, I mean, that's why I love being in a hotel actually, because it's all like so clean and minimalist. But the reality is for it to be that way, it requires a whole lot of work. And so I'm either going to outsource it and have somebody else make it look like a hotel because also I don't think it's worth me arguing to my husband about it because uh, that defeats the whole purpose, but it's also not worth me doing it. So if he does something, I'll just take it for however he has done it, right? It's not it's not a big deal at all if I would have done it differently. Um, and that's the house as, as an example, but it's also childcare. I've really, um, I've really completely let go, not childcare, but wanting to control when I'm not around, how they're being cared for if my husband is around, yeah. right? And so that was something that I also, as a woman, I see other women also really just have to clarify for themselves, what is your priority? Now, for some women, that might be a non-negotiable. They might want things to be done exactly the way that they want them to be done with the children, for example. And I respect that. But then you need to take that capacity into consideration as well and you might need to drop something else off your list then so the two lessons is take care of yourself make yourself a priority and drop some of the balls yeah yeah don't because this is exactly how men have been successful at doing this they don't try to do it all and they do what they prioritize and and then it goes back to one, do you have a relationship, right? Because there's also single parents out there, of course. It's a different dynamic then as well. But if you are in a relationship, it just goes back to then, okay, this is what I think is important. What do you think is important? Are there similarities in there? Are there conflicts? Then let's resolve the conflict. Yeah. So at a company level, how can we support women who are mothers? Yeah. Like what can be done about that? Well, I mean... The most obvious one is being flexible in, in, in the work. And, um, and I love this aspect, actually. And I love that it has become somewhat of a norm now, although there has been a pullback from it a little bit as well really? in the past year. Yeah, I've noticed in like senior leadership levels across companies, like in my network, I hear more and more people say like, oh, you know, we need to like go back to, to work. And, but I think that agreeing core working hours and then agreeing also and then what the norms are with regards to does it have to be together in one space can it be remote and, and how does that work i think that's a key so everybody kind of just knows what what the norms are um but the norms should include flexibility they should allow for people and actually, this was one where Nike was incredibly advanced. Already years ago, they introduced flex work and they had, um, it started off with summer hours on Fridays, which was, you could take the Friday afternoon off and you could make up for it Monday through Thursday. And the reality is, is that if people are engaged, they will get the job done anyway and if they aren't engaged you need to find out why they aren't right and it's usually something that the company can do differently um so i'm really just a big believer of engaging with the workforce and understanding what is it that they need but then also if there are norms i think that by team and then by individual you need to show flexibility as well and i have yet to run into someone who abuses that because if you have clear accountabilities and clear deliverables and clear measures of success, what you do with that is you give people, you empower people 
and they enjoy uh, I, generally speaking, people really want to come and do a good job because we spend so much time at work, right? Why be stuck in a, you know, in a rut? Um, and I really believe that it's just innate in people's nature to want to do a good job. So if that is your starting point, it goes back to, you know, are you a fear-based leader or do you choose abundance, basically? I think if you go the abundance route, it is not going to be abused. And the team also becomes kind of this ecosystem where people help each other out, but also call each other out, right? And that, that's where true teamwork and collaboration, I think, comes into effect as well, where people feel responsible towards their own work, but also towards each other's work and how they need to help each other out. So I have yet, as I said, to experience it resulting into a negative spiral. I've seen the opposite though. Mm -hmm. If there's no flexibility, I have seen people disengage. I have seen people come up with tricks. Because right? at the end of the day, life is life. You need to you need to sometimes be able to to do something that interferes with your work. So yeah. I mean it's such a big, big conversation around that, isn't it? Yeah. With regards to you know, when talking about people finding tricks and yeah. loopholes, it's yeah. like, you know, you have your life, like things happen, you know, yeah. we are emotional, biological beings that are not robots, that we're yeah. not machines, like we yeah. cannot be, you know, as much as we say consistency is so important, and yes, it is, but we cannot be like completely consistent every single day. It's just yeah. not possible. It's just not how we built, not how we yeah. designed. And I think embracing that... Mm. makes a massive difference to how we feel in in the work environment and how we feel impacts our productivity. So yeah. they go hand in hand. Yeah, they absolutely do. Mm. I can actually only think of one instance where someone was the only person on any team that I've led who wasn't delivering whilst enjoying flexibility of working from home or um, coming in only for the core hours and such. But when, then with that person, when the performance, when the results were not being delivered, um, the performance feedback included, hey, you're, you're being put on a performance action plan because of these and these reasons. And one of the things that we're putting back in place is you have to come to the office and you have to be here nine to five because you have not shown us that you can be trusted to deliver. And um, and then that actually resulted at some point at, at the end of the action plan of this person being exited from the business as well. And, and I think that's perfectly fine. So if you have this flexible work environment, even more so than perhaps in a traditional environment that we had pre-pandemic, you need to really practice accountability and you also need to really manage with courage as well. And you need to be honest and, um, and also receive feedback honestly as well, right? You cannot, there's, there's no room in an environment like that to dance around if something doesn't work, because if you don't address that, it impacts the team and the morale in the team as well much quicker, I find, than if it's in another uh, more traditional work because it gets hidden. It's not as visible if somebody doesn't deliver, if everybody's in the office from nine to five and somebody, you know, drinks coffee all day, basically. If you're not engaged in what you're doing, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. Like maybe it might be more visible if you're not in the actual environment, but surely that's worse. Yeah. Because it's like, well, if you're really not wanting to do your work, you will find ways. Yes. You will find yeah. better ways to cheat the system. Yeah. So wouldn't you rather know? Yeah, exactly. So like, just, you know, I don't see any downside of giving people trust and doing what they're doing because... Well, if, if they don't deliver, have a conversation. If you, they're still not delivering, then let them go. Like, Absolutely. Just, everyone will be better off. Yeah, actually, you know, you're touching something so important. The culture of empowerment, which was one of those elements that I learned in that development program, the cornerstone of it is mutual trust and respect, actually. And, 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 and it's mutual. That's the whole point of it. And you need to extend trust. But also, yeah 
hold people accountable to it and have those have real talk with them mm-hmm. if it's not if it's not met. What has been the biggest barrier to your success, do you think? It perhaps is being underestimated at times. If you firmly believe that you're ready for a next step, uh, sometimes it can be that the organizational appetites might not be there for whatever reason. And we can actually unpick that quite a lot with regards to, well, what defines if somebody is ready or not from a a talent management point of view, right? And I think that I have been somebody who's always been really uh, focused and um, self-aware about my own development. And, um, And I think that... And that would actually be a tip that I would give to people as well as like always take charge of your own development. Don't wait for somebody else to develop you. Um, But also what that created was that not every manager really cares about developing their people, right? Like most managers perhaps don't, right? And that can create sometimes a barrier if somebody does take it really seriously and their manager doesn't, especially if you're in a larger corporation and organization, because that manager is in the talent reviews and they're supposed to uh, speak on your behalf on whether or not you're ready to move or what your capabilities are. And I have experienced this in the past where I felt that my managers either didn't care enough or just didn't really have the capability to talk about employees this way. And um, and then I suppose it depends on, again, what is the company you're in. So if you're in a larger corporation or company, it is actually no different than if you would move to another company. You, you need to network within that company as well. And you need to find people who would sponsor you. And this is where being somebody who, to me, authenticity is really, really important. As I was saying earlier, don't don't try to be something else in what you are. It was something that would be uncomfortable for me because I did not want people to just talk to me or about me because they liked me, but I wanted my results to speak for themselves. Um, but the reality is, is that sometimes anyone can get underestimated. And you just need to find then the right person who has the gravitas and the street cred in the company as well and who believes in you to, on your behalf, speak about you, even if your manager, you feel, doesn't at that very point. And I think that is something that I have faced in the past and I have been really lucky to have found sponsors Mm. throughout my career that that would was say it that. a deliberate process or at which point did you realize that that was essential for your success? Yeah, that was uh, when I was kind of at middle management and I wanted to get into, or I felt like I could have a bigger impact at a senior level, uh, more senior level than that. And um, I actually, I was unaware of this and it was another woman that told me um and we were, I remember this so vividly, actually, we were like three women and we were in our, I would say like maybe early thirties and we were after a meeting staying behind and just checking in with each other, how we're doing. And one of them asked me, Silvana, uh, are you not ready for a move? Like, you know, anytime soon. And I said, well, yeah, actually I am, but nothing is really happening in this space. And I did not want to leave the company that I was at at the time. And I was like, and I just don't understand why. Maybe I should like find another mentor. And she was the first one who made me aware of, you don't need another mentor. (laughs) Like you've been mentored enough. Mm -hmm. Like you're super capable. Like the last thing you need right now is a mentor. And then she made me aware of, that is such a default for women in particular and in developing women. And she said, what you need is a sponsor. Mm. <laughs> like what? It's like what's the difference? Yes, <laughs> exactly. What is the difference? Mm-hmm. And um when she explained it, I was like, oh, 
I think I have sponsors already. <laughs> like I, I, there are people that are more senior than I am that I know see the value that I add and the run rates that I still have, the potential that I have. And so I asked her, I was like, so how, like, how do you have a conversation like this? She was like, well, just, just go to, you know, one or two or whoever you think and, and just have this conversation with them that you think you're ready to advance and you feel like you need help with somebody like being present for you in those forums. And it was fantastic, really, because I reached out to two people and it was really awkward to do. Um, and I started with really asking them how they thought I was positioned and but also asking them for honest feedback on how they felt the organization viewed me at more senior levels. And um, it did a couple of things. One was actually the organizational appetite was a lot more positive than I thought it was, right? So it was actually something that I had built inside me. You told your own story to yourself. That yeah. wasn't true. Exactly, exactly. And it was like negative self-talk, really. And the other thing that it did was it made them aware that, hey, I'm interested to advance. And it, it was something they felt comfortable voicing on my behalf because they felt I was ready to advance as well. And so, um, and lo and behold, <laughs> it's like within no time, like the next talent review cycle, uh, a promotion came out, right? So it, it, it does work, but you have to be, um, you need either to have somebody around you who, who makes you aware of this possibility. And then you have to just be really open and vulnerable as well. Um, to, to go, or at least to me, it felt vulnerable to go and kind of like tell somebody like, Hey, I'm feeling a disconnect between where I am and where I believe I can be. And just, I mean, they could have also said, well, no, you know, read the signs, <laughs> like, you know, like maybe it's time for you to go. And actually somebody has said that to me as well. At some point, somebody has said to me, you've been so long with this company now, the best thing you can do is actually go somewhere else and get different experience and, um, yeah, just develop and, 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 and cut your teeth like in, in other places as well. And that was, um, that was also really valuable advice from another woman as well, actually. Mm. But you, you stayed at Nike for a long time. You were there for what, 18? N 19 years. 19 yeah. years. Was yeah. that the advice at that point where? It was a couple of years before that. Somebody had given me that advice before I left. And um, we were, we kind of knew that there was going to be another reorganization that was coming up. And I was just so not ready to leave Nike at that time when she told me this. And um, because I really felt that one, I had invested a lot in the company, but I felt the company had invested a lot in me as well. And I loved it. And I still think Nike is an amazing company actually to work for. And I also felt it felt unfair to have to leave to advance, but actually it's a piece of advice I give to people now as well, because it is true. Um, and it's also comparable to if somebody has always been in the same function and always grown up the ranks in that function, which I think is very valuable and commendable, right? But if you are a leader in a function you've always been in, how do you know how good of a leader you really are if you haven't tried to lead in a different company or a different function? It's like separating your success yeah. versus you know the structure and the company. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's really easy to be really, uh, to be a high performer in a company you've been in 19 years. You know everyone, you know everything, you know all the systems, all the processes, so, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think there's plenty of people that don't progress. So I think being able to progress anywhere is yeah. is, is hard. But um, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. But I have noticed that by leaving Nike, I had to really fall back and trust on um, my skills 
and I, I and predominantly my ability to learn quickly. And that is something that I didn't realize was a strength when I was at Nike because the learning was different then. Um, but if you come to a completely different company, you you need to just tap into, you need to trust the different people first and foremost, mm-hmm. right? And you need to just really quickly be able to learn what is happening. And I actually see this also with people who've been in their function their whole career at the same company sometimes. And if they want to be an executive, you need to, for your own confidence, I think, you need to have experienced either a leadership role in an adjacent function, because of course you cannot go from, or it's unlikely that you will go from finance to product creation, right? So it kind of needs to be adjacent moves, but being deliberate about your skills that you want to learn and creating a career map, that is something at some point, if you want to become a senior leader, is very, very helpful. Mm. Yeah. How do you decide when it's the right time to move on? It is um, usually what you do is when you, or what, what I do is when I start a role is... I try to map out before how long I'm planning to stay in that role. And that is based on what is the contribution that I think I can make in this particular role. And and I always, in in the back of my head, create a multi-year roadmap with some of the key deliverables. Now, if those, if those key deliverables happen, that's a second, right? It's a different one because you need to adapt, of course, when you're in the role. But I think any role at mid to senior level, ideally you're in it like three years is kind of like the, the minimum, I would say, in an ideal state because the first year ideally you create a baseline and you get to know the team and the organization. And then the second year, a key deliverable would be actually seeing some of the improvements that you started to implement in the first year. And then the third year usually is really a year where you like get the sweet fruits of your hard labor of the previous two years. And then I think you can be in the role as long as you enjoy doing it really. But to me, as particular mid to senior level, three year typically speaking, would be the minimum because that's when you would see the outcome of a strategic cycle as well. Um, So yeah, that would be my ideal. Hmm. Going back to women in the workplace, what do you think is the biggest barrier to women to getting ahead? Um, It's a combination of factors. I think A, a lot of times what I see is that uh negative self-talk is pretty prevalent in women as well so a lot of time um when i start mentoring other women um they put up a lot of barriers themselves about their capabilities and what do people think of that so that's a big one to be aware of them and ignore them basically just like just don't listen to it like today somebody was telling me something about like oh i don't even know if i'm you know i don't I don't even know if I'm capable to do it. It's like, of course you're capable to do it. Like, just you are. Just take that as a given. If you don't believe it, just act like you are. Um, because other people that you trust would tell you if you wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. So that's important. Like, you need to have people around you that would give you the honest feedback. Um, the other part is that is a, that is a big barrier is. Once you believe it yourself, other people need to believe it as well. And um, having unconscious bias still being pretty rampant in organizations is is a barrier that women need to overcome. And they cannot do this themselves. They need to have allies and sponsors that do this for them. And there is this phrase that I've adopted, which is you can you can think your way into a new way of acting 
or you can act your way into a new way of thinking. And this goes for the individual, the woman, but it also goes for the organization. Sometimes you just need to be just really tactical and practical about how are we going to advance more women. Um, so how do you push this systemic change as a leader? It is re- it, it, it is by bringing other, like re- self-reflection, but also bringing your peers into a space of reflecting on this and really holding up a mirror and challenging the status quo. And um, if it is about, for example, having a diverse leadership team, um, calling out that it's not diverse, <laughs> it's like a, a very obvious one, right? So you can do it with data if you want to do it over a bigger segment of the company. But also what has worked really well for me in the past is just saying like, I mean, look around the room, mm. <laughs> just look around. And it's not just gender. It is every different facet of diversity. It's just not there yet. Mm. And in particular, if you are in a company that delivers a product or service to consumers, which that's every company, (laughs) you need to have representation of those consumers. And there still is such a big hurdle and barrier. Um, Oh, you know, there aren't enough women or there aren't enough people from other uh, races or it's just nonsense. It's there aren't enough because you don't have the network. Mm. (laughs) It's like because you're You're not reaching out. Word for word what (laughs) Dr. Grace Lorden was saying the other day, like literally word for word what she was saying. It's like it's nonsense. It's like, oh, there's not enough. It's just just simply not the case. It's just simply not the case. Um, The other thing also, which is a big difference as well, And I have seen it modeled by amazing leaders, which is fantastic, really, is um, take as a leader the courageous decision to go against um, what your comfort zone would be. And so if you are in talent reviews, watch the language that's being used about women and men or white people and black people, or, I mean, black women are, I mean, statistics, I mean, the facts are just there that um, they are disadvantaged in these conversations. And it goes back to the language that's being used with regards to when you talk about somebody's performance and correct it, call it out. And it's very uncomfortable and very awkward, but it has to be done. And I found that if you do it, Actually, people, other leaders usually are okay with that because they want to do the right thing as well, right? And the other thing that I've noticed that's very different in um, talent reviews or hiring decisions is that men easier are um, hired or moved into a position based on their potential than women. And so you have a double whammy here because often women already don't apply to jobs where they don't feel that they have 100% or 150% of everything that's required. Um, whereas men, if they have 80%, they're like, yeah, good enough, I'll do it, <laughs> right? Because of course po- I can do it. So, yeah. so it's two hurdles, right? One is the woman applying for these roles and really trusting that she can learn on the job because everybody learns on the job. And then also the hiring manager or the the team that's making those talent decisions, um, unconsciously being more comfortable taking a risk based on potential on a man than on a woman. Mm. There's some interesting points on that because again, I'm bringing my conversation back to Dr. Grace Lorden. And she, in her book, Think Big, she gives a lot of behavioral insights, uh, behavioral science insights Mm. about kind of how to progress your career. And there is a theory where, you know, the the reason men put themselves out there, even if they don't have 100% of all of this qualification skills and whatnot, is because of dating. Mm. Because they have to be the ones usually to go out and ask a woman. It's fascinating. And that's, I thought that was quite an interesting insight. And the other thing they're talking about having 100% of everything on a CV 
Well, that just does not exist. Like being a recruiter <laughs> and a headhunter and how companies construct a job description. It's like, well, we had this person who was doing X, Y, and Z and they were great, but somebody else was doing this. So why don't we just add a little bit from this person and a little yeah. bit from that person? And all of a sudden you have this magical unicorn yeah. that will never, it, there's, there's nobody out there that will have 100% of that. And it is absolutely a barrier to women because they don't feel the confidence to be able to say, well, you know, I'll just kind of like learn on the job, as you say. But yeah. even the expectations of having everything. It's just, it's not realistic. Like just take that as a fact. It's it really not. isn't because nobody has it all. No. And that's the whole point of being a leader actually is that you, that you can bring the best out of the team actually, and that you can build a team that all the, you know, summing it all up, all the parts that creates the high performing team. Um, but yeah, no, that's, you said something really interesting about, um, relationships there because I think that that is maybe also a big difference if I think about the EQ element of leadership um, and just having this awareness of everything is a relationship and um, and there are so many parallels to romantic relationships in in work relationships as well and I think that that is perhaps something that people with high EQs, um, in addition to IQs as well, of course, are um, better leaders because they can bring those things together and they understand and aware of, you know, basic human relationship um, norms, mm. almost. And I think a lot of issues that happen within you know, why somebody's unhappy where they are is to do with the relationship. Mm -hmm. Most frequently to do with the relationship with the hiring manager yeah. or, you know, their boss. It's, you know, sometimes it's about colleagues, but most often it's to, to do with that. And I was talking to uh, Lou Adler, who is one of the top headhunters in the world. And he was talking about how out of, I don't know, 800 placements that they've made, a very, very small percentage, they've analyzed what was what went wrong and majority of those was because they didn't get on with with the boss that's fascinating and talking about relationships when when i'm coaching individuals quite often it boils down to their triggers and how they communicate with somebody who potentially they might have conflict with and it could be a peer it could be anyone and that is for sure one of the most important things to work on and as somebody who is interested in relationships like I read a lot of books around that and applying them to your friendships not just your romantic partners but also to your colleagues to your clients to everyone around you it makes such a difference like being able to find that voice and yeah, yeah I've got two books that I can highly recommend on, on that topic and quite often I would recommend those books because if you wanted to take something into control of yourself like understanding that is it like opens up a whole new world that is actually you you I completely agree with what you're saying and i i um i i mentor a couple of people in in at super dry that are at the middle management level of the company and one of the things that i engage with them on is if you have a difficult message to bring, whether it's your, you know, team member, um, uh, a customer, exactly the examples that you said, it's like pretend that they are your best friend mm. and tell, talk to them, you know, share it with them the exact same way that you would do it in, in that scenario. Because what would you do if you would talk to somebody you really care about? You would, you would first and foremost, you would share tact. You, you know, you would show up with tact, right? But you would also be honest and you would be also more open to hearing what they're saying, but you would definitely tell them also the hard truths that you feel you need to share with them because you um, care about them. And you would therefore more easy and naturally choose abundance rather than fear. And that is something that has been working really well for people to really just 
just pretend, not pretend, but just act like you really care about the person that you talk to. Yeah, well, I think it's the the acting, but also, you know, really trying to find that part of yeah. you to connect with something about them that you exactly really appreciate. Yeah. And I think a lot of the times, whether you're looking for a co-founder for your business or, you know, a COO or, yeah. you know, your right hand man or, you know, somebody who you're going to be spending quite a significant amount of time working with, mm. you need to look at are they complementary to me in terms of their skills? Yeah. Are they similar to me in terms of values and vision? And then the last thing is like, well, how do they resolve conflict? Yeah. It's like, how can you, when we don't see eye to eye, can you be respectful of the differences? And then can you actually, you know, work on conflict resolution? And I think that is something that's really... Those key. are such good points. And how often really are those addressed in interview processes? Well, it's very hard to do that yeah. because it's something that needs to be it's a behavior. It's not something, you know, you, you, you can have all of the ideas and knowledge of how to do it. But then when it comes to practically doing that, <laughs> yeah. it's a whole other ball yeah. game because, you know, when you're yourself triggered and acting in the moment, having the self-awareness to kind of assess where you are and then deliver the message, it, it's, it's a skill. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it is a skill. So working on that, I would say is probably one of the most critical things for anyone in work but from your perspective like what what three tips would you give women who are very passionate about their careers they want to get ahead you know they want to get promoted they want to get to the top like what three tips would you give them the first tip would be know the reason why you want to do it and um, and be honest to yourself about the reason why you're doing it, because I think the next things, the next actions and steps that you take are completely driven by that. So understand why you want to advance and, and, and do it. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer there at all. Um, the, the second tip would be now, you know, exactly why you want to advance Hopefully it is because you feel that you can contribute something to others, something along those lines, because the only wrong answer actually to the first one is that, you know, others can contribute something to you. Um, and if you're clear on what it is, so why you want to do it and what it is that you can add value in actually, um, those two things together are a fancy way of being able to describe your brand, really, <laughs> or a less fancy way of describing what your brand is. Um, and then lastly, it would be the tip of go for it and don't, don't shy away from it. It's really just step into it um, because I do see that a lot of people that 100% have the capability and the potential are really afraid of, oh, I won't be able to live a life anymore, or uh, I cannot, I won't be able to do it, or uh, why would they want me to be in that role? And those are all just internal mental models that, that we just need to park, move to the side, because if you have even like the slightest, littlest, like, but what if, like, just go for it. Because I can tell you out of my own experience, I don't work until midnight every day, mm -hmm. right? And often that's what people think. Or people think like, oh, I can't, I don't think I want to deal with the heat of being at these senior positions. But really, I don't feel that it's a lot more heat where I'm now than when I was a middle manager, really, right? So... Sometimes it's also just the fear of the unknown. And uh, in a lot of cases, I think it's the fear of the unknown and step into it because you can go for it and you can always pull out from, you don't need to do this for the rest of your life. If you don't like it, you can always change, right? Mm. But just, just go for it. So those were, would be my three ones. Know why you're doing it. Know what you will be able to contribute. 
and what will make you feel good about that and then go for it. It's bringing back to what you were saying earlier about having the mentality of either coming from fear yeah. or coming from abundance. Yeah. And it's that fear that prevents you from taking the leap. So like how can you work on your ment- like your mentality yeah. about seeing the abundance in the world yeah. and the opportunities as opposed to all of the risks? Yes, exactly. And what advice would you give your younger self? Um, I would tell her to trust herself more. Um, because I think she, she was in initially that ambition came from feeling gratified by the recognition that was given, but it's quite dangerous when you're in that space because it's external, then it doesn't really come from within. And so I would really say to the younger me, Trust yourself and go at a pace you want to go. And um, because then you build such a strong foundation from within that any feedback you get is valuable because you also will then be more confident in putting feedback to the side that you feel just doesn't, that can be somebody's, it's, it's valuable, but it's not necessarily always something that you agree with, right? Mm-hmm. And I think in the beginning, perhaps I was getting so much instant gratification from external feedback and recognition that I would pull the levers to keep getting that rather than growing and developing based on what I thought I had to grow and develop in the, in the beginning of my career. So trust yourself. Mm. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you and just, you know, fascinating as always. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.